I'd like to begin today with an acknowledgement of the Woody Woody people, an acknowledgement of elders past, present and future, whose land we stand upon today, right on the boundary between Dharawal and Ewan nations here in southern New South Wales in Australia. I would like to show my deep appreciation for your custodianship of this place since ancient times and your protection and holding of knowledge and wisdom which we so greatly need today. Thank you Tim. And we're here today to listen to a story that Tim is going to tell us, a story taken from two times in his life when he was in the midst of a climate driven catastrophe. There is of course trauma within such stories and so I invite you to be mindful of anchoring yourself as you need to maintain a sense of uh, safety. So Tim and I, we're looking around here at the, the ver huge variety of the greens of the growth all around us through this bushfire affected area. And at home, if you would like to please look around and note the green in your room outside the window and take that in and return to, that, to an awareness of the green as you may need as you listen to this story. So now, Tim, will you take us into the bush to tell us your story? Indeed. As a young man, I journeyed to a faraway land in search of adventure. And adventure is exactly what I found wandering into the desert with a couple of indigenous peers guys of similar age as my guides. And I began sandboarding down enormous dunes, experiencing home-baked meals and being welcomed in to community and home and very much experiencing the kindness of strangers. How that experience evolved was into a very unexpected lesson that I was not ready to receive. A few days into this grand adventure, conditions shifted remarkably and radically. And what occurred first was really a revelation, both to me and my guides, that in this driest of environments, there can come rain. They in their early twenties had never experienced rain of this strength before. And initially, it was a delight. They became almost childlike, playful. And the environment itself responded. As the dusty, dry surface layer was washed away, as the rain built up over the minutes and hours, what was revealed was a color scheme far more varied than this one, and even more saturated, vibrant oranges, dark greens and greys, and this complex stratering of the dunes that essentially revealed a landscape that looked like it was carved out of marble. But that most joyous of revelations was in stark and marked contrast to what followed later the very same evening. This shift from vivid color and playful jollity into darkness and despair. The rain persisted, but we did not with our plan, and we hiked hard, returned to our vehicle, and began the journey back to the township where my guide's families resided and where they had spent their entire lives. On the drive back, a hailstorm smashed the roof, the windshield, and we were reduced to walking alongside the vehicle as we proceeded at a snail's pace back into town. By the time we arrived, darkness had fallen and with it, a cataclysmic experience. As we crested one of the hills that sat either side of the township, we looked down at what was a surging torrent of water running from the faraway landscape of mountains and surging right through the middle of this vibrant community. We took the vehicle as far in as we could before the throngs of people doing whatever they could to try and intervene, rescue, salvage, stopped our vehicle and we joined the throng. Nothing could be done. The 
waters had come very rapidly as they tend to and in this part of the world there's no early warning so we were reduced to near total impotent three young men desperately trying to do whatever we could but all we could do was sit on the crumpled bonnet of our land cruiser and watch as homes businesses and lives were lost to this ecological disaster the memory which is seared viscerally into my mind was looking out and in the headlights of our vehicles and others watching as a family of three generations calmly sat on the tin roof of their home as the waters rose and the walls melted and they disappeared into those surging turgid waters the night passed and the dawn of the next day revealed really a completely shifted terrain. The town was gutted. Very little, if anything, remained structurally in the pathway of the flood, which had now receded to around knee high. We waded out along with the majority of the community trying to see what, if anything, could be recovered. My guides, walking side by side with me, walked softly and lightly, none of us knowing what each footfall might bring. We reached the other side without having either made a rescue or suffered any injury. They both took off up the hill to their family homes where fortunately no one in their family had come into harm's way. And I found myself sitting alone beside an old man who was similarly by himself. We entered into a conversation in a common shared language and all of his questions toward me were of concern for my well-being and of inquiry as to what I thought about what we had both experienced in the previous evening's events. After a short while, he stood and beckoned me to follow him and he walked off to a building just a dozen or so metres away. He opened the door and he beckoned me again to follow him. As I approached the doorway, I could see that this was a shop. This was his shop. He was an antiques dealer. And I confess that my first response was one of hesitation and discomfort that at this moment, the last thing I wanted to buy was a trinket. Uh, a reminder. Um, I would happily have given this man anything that I had. I had given all of my money away that I had on my person the previous evening. So when I said to him, I'm sorry, but I'm not here to buy anything, he stopped, turned to me, paused and said, you're not here to purchase, you're here to receive. And here is something that I would like to give to you. And he bent down to a table, he picked this up and he held it out to me. And he said, I give this to you and I invite you to wear it so that you will remember what you have seen and you will know what to do. He then ushered me to the door closed it and I never saw him again. The next day, having spent a night in the home of one of my guides, I took a bus away from the devastation. I returned to the capital city and I did not stop. I did not pause. I did not hear this call I did nothing. I got on a plane and went back to my life and I carried on. Nothing shifted, nothing was different. My being remained the same. Many years later, as a older man, not too far from where I tell this story now, another very different 
but in some way paired experience brought me a different kind of change. On January the 4th, 2020, my home, my neighborhood, my community sat in the path of the Karawan fire, one of many that was active throughout the black summer bushfires in Australia. And this devastation zone is a very tiny fragment of the land that that single fire devastated. We were in the midst of our second evacuation, the second of third within 10 days. And in one of the final acts before we fled our home, I was on the roof, on the ridgeline, with this somewhat pathetic plastic drip hose, <laughs> trying to figure out how to wedge it up on the peak of the roof so that the little feeble flow would descend down either side. I was crouched down on the ridgeline with two half bricks in my hand, trying to prop them over this hose so that it wouldn't slip. And all of a sudden, something shifted and I moved from a crouch to an upright position. And as I ascended, I entered a different space. And there was a shift in my consciousness. Aside from my sight, all of my other senses were nulled. There was no sound. There was no feeling of heat or of wind on my skin. But what I saw was a complete blanket of flame. And as I turned 240 degrees, everything that I saw was on fire. Not in the dark, fierce force of a bushfire. There was no choking smoke. What I saw was a Hollywood-esque depiction with vibrant, shooting flames 60 feet up in the air with the tinge of blue around those dancing flames. This vision stayed with me as I received a message. I did not hear a voice. No one spoke to me. But the words I received were excruciatingly precise and ultra poignant. From what is coming there is nowhere to hide. All you can do with all that you are is everything you can. The moment passed, the flames I had envisioned receded. I came back to my present self. I put my bricks down. <laughs> I retreated from the roof. And from the moment my feet hit the floor, I was different. My being had changed. And this call I heard. And from that moment on, as I've processed and intuited and shared and evolved these two events separated by years and long distances, have intertwined and the intersection of them I have come to realize is one of appreciation for my role and the role that we all can choose to play in hearing these moments of calling from our lives. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll speak now with Sally and we'll unpack this a little bit more. I was really struck him at this time, listening to the story, the difference in your delivery. Right. And I wondered what it was like for you to be telling the story in this place, because I think this is, as you said, the first time you've told it out in the, com in the country here. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, in some way, it feels um, like it's more welcomed here if that makes any sense mm. at all. Mm. Like we stand here in the middle of the devastation. This fire was nearly two years ago. The stress that this landscape has endured is so obvious mm. um, that all is not well here. Um, 
but I just feel so deeply connected to this land and this place that it just when you've remarked before that this is a story that tells itself that's mm. sort of be I'm being drawn to tell and I feel that now more than ever before mm. Mm. I could really feel your solidity with the story that you're telling and I could feel too us being held here in this country and what it means to hold the story at such a personal level I mean it's a deeply personal story uh, and at the same time to know it is a collective story, it is the story of many, it will be the story of many more. Mm. Um, and how, how this has developed for you, the, the bringing the personal to the collective and the sense then you're moving more and more into working with this in terms of community and collective. So listening this time, you, yes, I could really feel your groundedness and your strength. And I felt the strength of being here surrounded by these trees. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about the movement for you from being in a very personal place with obvious trauma, and I've noticed the trauma felt less in you this time in the telling, uh, and moving it more into a collective story, a story which relates to many people and, and probably many more to come, and how you've worked that through those different layers. Um, how essential has it been for you to tell the story in community? Well, I think... So I think essential is the word because the story essentially was, you know, kind of uh, disempowered and disembodied um, by the dislocation that, that I felt from it. Um, and it's really only been brought to any um, purpose at all by being shared um, and evolved. And most particularly and where that evolution has been so swift has been since it was shared where with others in the in the community here, some of whom lost homes, you know, in, the, in that very same fire, what I imagined they experienced. Um, and I've been so, so, so conscious of, again, what's mine to do in sharing um, this story, but the sharing of it has been very much welcomed and people have felt a release. Um, I've been thanked by people who've lost their homes that they don't feel at this point in time able to share their story or um, the, uh, the connection for them is, uh, is, is with this one incident. Um, and I think what's, what's really interesting now is what seems to be building and the invitation to sort of explore this whole approach to uh, community cohesion and resilience that can come through really any kind of creative expression of experience uh, in a story. I'd like to pick up on the bangle, because last <laughs> time we talked, you told me something which I, I would love for everyone to hear about when you actually started wearing this bangle for sure. today. Um, and to really reflect, I think, on that message you got from, from the two of the men, an indigenous man, a, a wise old man by the sound of it, who was giving you a gift way beyond you knew what you knew you were receiving at that time. Yeah. But that has changed now. I think there's a couple of things there. I think there's there's the capacity mm -hmm. to receive a nudge of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. significance. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the, the sort of the salience, you know, that provoked me to put it on and then there's the resonance with which I now mm -hmm. bear it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this was, to all intents and purposes, a trinket mm -hmm. after that first experience. You know, the disassociative response was so strong that I really put it in a box and did not go back to it. That having been said, I didn't discard it either. Mm -hmm. And wherever I went and however I roamed, I always kept it enclosed but close to me. Um, and then this was the instigating incident you know sort of hitting the ground after the experience on the rooftop coming back inside first meeting my wife and really completely unable to describe um even to you know sort of put any kind of sensible voice to what was happening and then after she basically told me to you know just do what we needed to do to get away to flee and then i could unpack that with her later the very next thing i did was go into my bedroom go to that box grab this out and put it on um, and then really every day since I have chosen each morning to put it on 
when I'm working, mm -hmm. that this mm -hmm. really now is a signifier to me that I'm in this purposeful mode, you know, doing the work that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, it's become you know, sort of a, a symbol of a number of things on a number of levels. And I'm struck by the message, remember what happened here. And remembering to remember has many, many different layers of meaning to it. So I'm thinking about the movement from away from trauma or the healing of trauma when we do remember, mm. about the bringing of body back, yep. the membering of our body, and how in some layer of your psyche you're holding all of this ready for that moment. Mm. And that that old man knew that that moment would come. You would know when to remember and then put this on and to know what to, to do. Yeah. Which is really moving. <laughs> and it holds for me too the something of the ancient, of the traditional indigenous, and of the mature, because there's also a personal story here of you being a young man <laughs> not knowing what to do. And now you coinciding with this moment in time, in our collective place, and now knowing what to do. Mm. So I think something that I've really only just started to explore is what the embodied memory is and you know connecting to the very sort of energetic pent-up action that I initially was sort of carrying you know as a former lifesaver you know, save lives in open and, 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 and sort of protected water and then just being completely unable to intervene. Mm. I couldn't even find a rope, mm. you know, and everyone that was, was still within reach was, was way beyond, you know, the, the, the assistance of anything other than a, rest, a helicopter rescue at that point in time. But that then did shift into this, you know, kind of classically kind of collapsed resignation state and that sense of, you know, helplessness and an inability and all three of us were kind of lined up in that kind of crouched position you know with our, our sort of knees up even though we could have adopted any number of positions you know we were kind of almost fetal in a row on that bonnet um, and the, the really interesting thing and again I'm really just sort of starting to unpack it now was that shift of posture so explicit you know from crouching in a very sort of focused mode to sort of standing and turning and, and see, just seeing. Um, long way to go with my discovery of what that all means, but there is it, almost like this is a key in a way, right? Um, and and that, that is helping me to open some of these pathways and, and sort of carry in an outward sense what these experiences have been. Mm almost like an initiation or it is an initiation but it is a very slow slow developing yep. you know like a seed which knows its time has come just as so many seeds in this bush have not sprouted into fine new things mm. i also think i wonder how it feels to you in telling this to the community i i know for me one of the most common things people say to me when we talk about climate is but I don't know what to do, or what mm. I feel I can't do anything. Yeah. And this is a story that you have now brought together, which so explicitly talks about knowing what to do, and perhaps with that knowing not what not to do. Um, and ans reaching in for that timing and that preparedness and that meeting of person, circumstance, community, land. No, I think that, that there's a lot in there. I think that there's a lifetime's work in, in just unpacking that. But I think certainly what I found, and, and, and this is um, you know, something that really the, the, the seed was sown or, or the genesis of was, was in this first public sharing of this story, you know, in place, in community here, um, was the whole approach of the, the collective experience and the collective healing and the mm. connective preparation that can mm. be done. Mm. Um, so personally, it's been really trying to connect with place. I mean, you remarked um, before, uh, 
will never be an expert, but I've become a lot much more familiar with this land and mm. with the fauna and flora thereof. I've come to view my um, role um, you know, in the home place as one of custodianship and really looking at you know, this little parcel as an opportunity to regenerate land and um, to bring much more of you know, the sort of the productive um, native expression of, of potential uh, from the, the garden that we have. Um, involve our kids in an age appropriate version of these conversations. Mm. Um, and you know, we talk a lot as a couple about the deep connection that we both feel. Mm. And very, very few people um, have fled this area. Mm. Um, even though, according to some, you know, this is now in the top 10 most exposed regions in the country for a repeat of this. And again, what we can see around us here is a deeply traumatized landscape mm. that is set to burn again. Um, the resilience in these trees here will take decades to return. Um, but people are persisting and if anything are leaning in and coming together um, and opening to each other and forming bonds between each other. Um, and I think that really that is where the work is. But the grief felt the love and with that love comes commitment and you know your sto story speaks so much to that and I'm wondering what responses you have already noted in telling this the few times you had in different communities how do people respond well what, what I'll observe and report first of all is an absence of mm. so that which I feared the most of you know, sort of revulsion or you know, shaming mm. or um, really calling out any sort of inappropriateness of sharing mm. you know, a story which I really literally imagined compared to others who have lost loved ones, mm. homes, businesses. Um, there hasn't been any of that. Um, the, 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 the probably three strongest um, sort of convergent um, observations have been gratitude, um, have been acknowledgement, and it sticks in my throat even saying it, but acknowledgement of bravery that others view what I'm doing as a courageous endeavor to stand and tell this story. Um, and also this, this sort of like the overall label I'll give is optimism, but, but this sort of hopeful action that even in a story, we can you know, gather momentum, you know, even if that is just together into whatever may lie ahead, let alone you know, that hopeful convergence that there'll be a compound effort mm -hmm. to change the seemingly inevitable outcome mm -hmm. um, and various versions in between. So I think those three things, you know, sort of gratitude, mm -hmm expression of, you know, this is a courageous effort um, and some kind of active hope-based mm. optimism. Mm. Those, those, those three things would be the mm. most convergent. Yeah. Mm. And I know that you're now looking at taking this experience on with others who are also there at the first storytelling, uh, an artist and a poet, mm. uh, to work with some sort of community storytelling social enterprise. Yeah. So what is it you know, the message is all you can do with all that you have. Can you talk a bit what is emerging with that as you collaborate with other artists and communities? Yeah, I mean, I think as much as I can speak to it now, I think there's a long road to go. And, you know, let's have this conversation again in mm. one, three, seven years and see where it's taken us all. But I think that the, the most poignant part of that message is yeah, everyone has a role, mm. but the role isn't one of, you know, some sort of like wrenching shift, you know, to do the kind of classic road to Damascus and leave mm. everything behind mm. and go on a redefined, renewed mm. path, right? This isn't yeah. a rebirth. It's more of a rediscovering, right? Kind of a coming back to what is most 
vital, what is most necessary. And it's almost a kind of a strengths-based approach, right? Sort of take all that you are, take everything that you've done, everything that you've seen, everything that you know how to do, and then apply it to this. Mm. It's not kind of leave all that stuff behind. You know, mm. if you're an accountant, well, don't be an accountant anymore. Now you've got to be an artist. Whereas no, well, you know what, be an accountant, just apply it over here. Mm. So, okay, maybe I can tell a story. Um, you know, two women that you know I'm, 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 I'm partnering with, one of them is a painter and the other one is a poet. So, you know, what's the role of a poet in you know, addressing the climate movement or the, you know, trying to engage in climate action? Well, it's both speaking, you know, with the poignancy and precision of a poet to these extremely complex systemic events. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also equipping and enabling others to put their words and voice to their own experience. Um, and Bonnie as a painter, um, is doing lots of incredible things, but one in particular was this journey that she took one of the um, communities here, Cabago, that's experienced some of the most horrific impact um, and taking them on this layering journey of producing each member of the community that wanted to be involved, producing three paintings, layering them and then stripping back the layer of the worst of the horror and then stripping back the layer of where they are right now and then revealing and really kind of nesting with the vision of the hopeful future that they each individually and then collectively hold and i think as a piece of work that's an incredibly powerful example and it's just one example of one expression and one mode by which any and all means people can come together and find that flame of hope but it is for me, particularly essential because it is collective meaning making mm. and it is collective grieving and processing of trauma. And I feel very moved when I think of the seeds of this back there in the desert and that great deluge and that old man who possibly witnessed perhaps an earlier experience of that 70, 80 years ago and his sense that this is what does endure in us and this is what grows and can, can flourish uh, and that we must do the work of germinating, we must do the work of fertilizing and we must do the work of standing and being and receiving and mm. sharing. I've been aware as we've stood here that the wind has come through at several moments when we've talked and of course the indigenous thing is when the wind comes this is the moment to take it. Yeah. So I want to thank you, Tim, for your yes, for your courage and your willingness to put on the band, <laughs> to remember and to know what you you need to do and to reach out to others and to share this. So it can be much greater than anything you could alone do. And uh, to hold the wisdom and the gift. Well, thank you, Sally, for all that you have contributed to the evolution of this story already, for your inquiry today, for holding the space for that version of the story to emerge today, and for everything, of course, that you are doing as part of this collective effort. Thank you.